Good morning, you men, Maya Weekend Warriors, 30 years. Yes. I know that I've seen many of you here many times before, but it's, it's a real privilege to be here on this occasion, and especially because uh, we have the incredible honor of having President of Honduras and his beautiful wife with us here today, as well as uh, our Vice President, who was instrumental and incredibly supportive uh, of this exhibit from, from day one. I think uh, probably some of you, if not all, have already gone through and seen the exhibit, and I would like to congratulate and ask for an applause for all those people who worked on it. it today about uh, stars and scholars in the archaeology of Copan. So let's get going because I have a lot of slides. <laughs> anyway, back in uh, 2006, I was uh, doing some consolidation work on the north side of uh, Temple 16. Uh, Copan, of course, Temple 16 is back there. We roofed over this whole section in order to be able to consolidate it without rains falling on it. And uh, as part of this consolidation work, we also started working on uh, structure 10L50, which is kind of attached uh, to the lower parts of the north terraces on the north side of Temple 16. And you can see a close-up here as the consolidation work is starting. We're resurfacing. Uh, the Rosalinda Temple is buried directly underneath all of this, and a lot of the consolidation work had to do with uh, avoiding um, uh, water filtration, which was causing some damage to the building uh, down below. And in the, the excavating of structure 1050, we found this, a bullet uh, shell. And on the back of it, it said UMC 7 millimeters. This was on the 18th of August, 2006. And so uh, we started doing some research. What, what was this artifact? I'm sure it wasn't being used by the Maya, so who uh, was to blame for this? And it turns out that it was produced by the Union Metallic Cartridge Company which was created to produce ammunition for the Union Army during the Civil War. So obviously this is a fairly old bullet. In essence, the 7 millimeter bullet was only used from about 1892 to the early 1900s. So this took me back in time. Okay, who, who, who were these creatures? Who were these guys? Uh, and uh, of course, did some archival research and found these incredible photographs at the Peabody Museum which show the, uh, uh, the uh, research headquarters for the Peabody Museum expedition to Copan. And this is Temple 16 right back here. And this is the West Court. So they set up shop right there. They, they knew the Maya kings had a good idea as to where to build a, a palace or a, a home. And so they did, it, they did the same. And this is somebody else, somebody will bring, will mention shortly, that's George Byron Ford um, right there. And so, um, it turns out that Temple 16 was originally excavated by uh, Sir Alfred Percival Mosley in the 1890s. And these photographs are from his uh, excavations there. And here he is in front of the Kiva A uh, at Copan. So this is definitely, this is a photograph of that uh, structure 10L50, uh, which he took after he had finished excavating. Of course, it was in a much better state of conservation than what it is today. And we had found a bullet back in there. Again, but why, why bullets? Well, this is what Copan looked like in those days. Um, it, was, it was in the middle of the jungle. It was heavily overgrown, and uh, there was really no road access into Copan. It was all done by, by mule, traveling back and forth. So, you know, back in here is the hieroglyphic stairway. Uh, and this is also part of the, uh, of the uh, expedition uh, orders for their, their staff. And um, this is what the main square of the town of Copan looked like <coughs> back in those days. Uh, no, no giant supermarket, no Wawa. Uh, and really and truly, if we think about it, you know, of course, resources were extremely limited. You know, 
and you had to finance this whole team of people out there uh, doing um, their work. So what did they do? Well, they had to hunt for food in order to be able to get it. You know, no refrigeration too, so this was an ongoing process. They were also in danger of being eaten. And that's what this character is, is doing back here. So obviously the, the armament was necessary for both producing food and for uh, to avoid being eaten. And the uh, last jaguar that I know of in Copan uh, was hunted in about 1960. So they, they were around up until uh, fairly recent um, times. There was also other reasons for being armed in this territory, and these were, of course, the revolutions. And I have this wonderful quote from Gustav Stromsvig, who was there just a few years later. He said, I was kept awake most of the night by violent discussions out in the plaza between the leading citizens of Copan. The, deta the details I wasn't able to follow, but the revolution and the nearby rebels was the theme. About 5.30, the Comandante Local, who is my canal boss, came to tell me that he had orders from Dr. Rodriguez to take some 50 men and go, some word I couldn't decipher, north of Santa Rita to stop the road there. So this is, I mean, this is very much a part of the life of these early researchers. Uh, and um, Santa Rita is the uh, the town, the closest town to Copan, and it was a much larger town than, than, than Copan itself was in these days. And Dr. Rodriguez was the Minister uh, of Education for uh, the government, and he was put in charge by the president of uh, having all relationships with the Carnegie Institution of Washington, who were, uh, were doing the work at that time. And this on the right here is uh, Gus Stromswick, whose uh, field notes I am, I am quoting here. And of course, when the, his canal boss is because he was building a canal to detour the Copan River away from the Acropolis and stop its erosion. So his canal boss then becomes a, 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 a warrior chief and he goes off to stop the rebels close to Santa Rita. Of course, that left uh, Gus Stromzig without any workers. More about that later. There was also a lot of disease and death. You know, and Here's another quote from Gus Stromzig. Copan has had the worst seat of sickness and death in its history many as two burials in a day. Over 200 people died during the year. That's 10% of the population. The blame was given to the water. I told them they were blooming fools, and that, that if they learned the vaguest notions of sanitation, they might get along better. But if they persisted in breeding mosquitoes and living in mud with the pigs they liked so much, they were probably better off in the graveyard. <laughs> very friendly opinion, they did. But uh, it, it was, of course, uh, later determined that it, this was, it was a malaria epidemic and you know, a lot of people were all dying. So these, these early scholars are having to deal not just with jaguars and, and the revolutions. Uh, there was a lot of disease and this uh, became uh, very poignant, I think, uh, when uh, John Owens uh, died in February of 1893 and he is actually buried in the, the Great Plaza. Uh, this is his tombstone uh, which reads, J.G. Owens died February 1893, a martyr to science. And this was, the inscription was uh, decided and had, and was produced by uh, Sylvanus Morley. And uh, John Owens was the director of the uh, Peabody Project. So fever and disease and death uh, were a very serious problem for all of these early researchers. Well, this is just a brief summary of uh, the directors of the early expeditions of the Peabody Museum to Copan, Marshal Salving, uh, Savo, John Owens, who died, Mosley, who we saw before, and George Byron Gordon. And uh, here we see uh, uh, Dapperly o uh, Owens in front of the Harry staircase. He was the one who first was actually excavated, had been found before by Mosley, but the actual excavations were done by Gordon. And he also made the first archaeological map of the Valley of Copan and the site itself, and became the Penn Museum director in 1910. So here's a beautiful link which Then the next big expedition was, of course, the one that Gus Stromsick was a part of, and it was really propelled by uh, Sylvanus Morley, who had been working in Copan and the inscriptions uh, in the uh, early uh, 20th century, and he really pushed strongly for the, the Carnegie project. And uh, Gus Stromsick, who was a Norwegian, and you can tell that by the way he writes in his notes, too, is not all that fluent in English, uh, is. Um, well, ended up being director uh, of the project for the longest 
the longest time. Now, um, Morley's work uh, at Copan was extraordinary too because it was really the beginning of uh, archaeoastronomical research at, at the site of Copan. Here, we, of course, we have uh, Morley at Copan uh, back in those days. And one of the um, things he proposed early on was this sundial between Stila 12 on the east side of the Copan Valley and Stila 10 on the west side with the main group in the middle. And he proposed that this was actually a sundial that set the date for burning the milpas and beginning the agricultural cycle on a yearly basis. So it was, it was a, a divider of time. It was uh, two monuments set up so that they would know when one of the most important things during the year had to happen, and that was when you can burn the fields before the rains come so that the fields will be ready to be planting uh, early in May. The date uh, is, of course, uh, on April 12th. So um, Morley, from this very beginning, tied um, this early working arc of astronomy, uh, he's tied the study of stars to the, to the production, to the economy, to the agricultural cycle, which of course was essential and vital for the ancient Maya. In the modern era, of course, we have a whole slew of new scholars coming in in the 70s. Uh, the great master of them all, Tony Avini, who's here someplace. <laughs> Uh, and then the Shili worked here, and then Harvey and Victoria Fricker came up with some interesting points of view. And then more recently, uh, the National University of Honduras uh, started working in Copan, and I was fortunate enough to work with them a bit, and a lot of what I'll be saying in a bit has to do with that research. Tony, of course, um, came and followed up on what Morty had started saying, and he uh, worked also on the, the sundial between Stila 12 and Stila 10, and actually proposed that it was a, a major baseline. And here's an actual photo from, from one student looking to the other one um, back there from uh, Tony's uh, Skywatcher book. And uh, again, he uh, confirmed the association uh, of this sundial with the agricultural cycle, and primarily, with, again, the burning of the fields. And he used a lot more ethnographic data to back up um, his claim. But he also proposed that this was a, a tremendously important baseline for the whole uh, creation of the main group. Uh, and uh, in this other uh, illustration he uses, this is the baseline back here, and the whole site is basically perpendicular to that. But he was uh, started doing all the detailed study uh, with topography and uh, all kinds of measurements to try to apply modern astronomy to Copan's uh, main group. And in doing so, he brought to light quite a number of, of other important discoveries. I, like I say, the, the site layout and also the importance of the zenith passage. In studying the, uh, the so-called Venus window on Temple 22, for example, he noted that the midline of the Venus window uh, actually also lines up with the baseline that is charted down below. He was also uh, one of the first to propose that um, the position uh, of Copan in a global sense at 50 degrees uh, north latitude uh, also placed it in the perfect place to add a different explanation to the creation of the Tzolkin. Because as you study uh, the distance between the, uh, the zenith passages at Koban, uh, the, uh, the uh, first one from uh, south to north and the second one from north to south, which are somewhere in that diagram, um, he noted that there was a 105 day distance between them on the short side and a 260 day distance between the other two. He also noticed that by adding a few of the other major solar events, the solstices and the equinoxes, he could actually uh, divide the entire solar year into 20-day uh, periods, or we not. And uh, again, so he's tying in a, a whole bunch of different elements uh, using uh, on-site observations and uh, modern astronomy and tying it all to Copan as well as many other centers in the Maya world. After that, of course, in the 90s, we had Linda Sheely working with us for many years at Copan. Uh, she, of course, was more into astronomy and Maya cosmology, uh, but her extraordinary work in that sense was also uh, a very broadly disseminated in her many, many publications. And then, uh, more recently, uh, Harvey and Vicki Bricker uh, worked on this uh, bench that was found by uh, the Penn State group in the late 90s at Copan, and it's, it's today at the uh, Sculpture Museum of Copan. It's an incredible, oops, um, 
uh, sky band, uh, and they sat there, and they, in their research, they did, again, uh, more contemporary work and looked, looked at the uh, location of the building it was in, structure 66C over here, and noted that it was really in alignment with the uh, zenith passage at Kofan. And in this case, in this diagram they show here is uh, what it would look like if you were looking through the door uh, of this building uh, with the sky band on it on the day of the zenith passage. And so they highlight the fact that this was tremendously important at Kofan. And uh, this work was then followed up in the, uh, starting in 1998 by the team of the uh, Autonomous National University of Honduras, uh, astronomer Maria uh, Cristina Pineda de Carillas and archaeologist Vito Velis actually found the Department of Arctic Astronomy at the National uh, University and began doing research uh, at Copan. Uh, this is the, primarily they focused on the north end of uh, the Great Plaza and they uh, of course uh, followed up on the work that Avini had done earlier on and uh, we're doing something that of course he recommends Heidi, that is doing uh, the observations on site and being there over a long period of time watching you know, the, the solstices, the equinoxes, and the passages of the sun for the zenith. On site, it was ongoing, it was long term, and uh, uh, along at the site studying mostly shadows, sunrises, and sunsets, the relationships between the documents, between the monuments, and using uh, or seeking information from monuments as markers to be able to um, register these important events. In a way, it's like the giant sundial brought down to a smaller scale in the Great Plaza. And so this is the, uh, the area of the Great Plaza that they worked on primarily. And you will notice, of course, that the north end of the uh, Great Plaza is, uh, is a little skewed. It's not straight like it should be. I mean, and we certainly know the Mayas knew how to do a, a right angle. So this, of course, is one of the things that drew their attention, as well as the alignment of structure 223 over here. But um, they, they, again, they focus primarily on this. And again, the one that has come to the foreground in, in all this work has been the day of the Zenith Passage, which just to sum it up briefly, it's the one day uh, in which the, uh, the sun is at noontime is directly overhead at, Kofan at, the, uh, at its uh, current latitude. So uh, uh, at midday, like you can see here, all of the stelas not just this one, of course, all of them have no shadows. And the other time of the year, they'll have a, a, you know, a smallish shadow on the north and south sides. And of course, they always have a, a shadow on the AM and, and the PM. But it's, uh, it's um, as Tony pointed out in his publications, it's really a day that's very easy to observe. All you need is some kind of upright uh, stump tree or a monument to be able to know and mark that uh, time of the year when the Zenith Passage takes place. So it's really a wonderful, uh, very practical uh, marker uh, that can be used to divide up the solar year. So anyway, well, Vito, uh, Maria Cristina, and myself have been working on this. This is the, this is the shadow outline of the north end of the, the Great Plaza. So the buildings are over here. So these are stairs and stairs over here. And of course, what they notice is uh, these are uh, sunrise observations on the day of the Zenith Passage, and it becomes very evident that this entire staircase is lined up uh, for the sunrise on the eastern horizon. And this is what it looks like. And you can look straight down the stairs, and there's the sun rising on the day of the Zenith Passage. Very clear um, and in a practical uh, thing you can observe. Of course, that's the day when there are no shadows on the steel at midday. And here we have a whole bunch of other markers that were detected. Of course, we have this one, which is the northwest staircase on the Great Plaza. That's the one we just saw. But a number of other very significant alignments were found. The one between Steel AE and Structure 223, right there. Um, the one between the corner of the Platform 1 and uh, Steel S A and H, right there. All of these mark the same event. Here you can see them again. This is the looking down the staircase and seeing the sun coming up directly in line with it. This is the alignment of the students from the corner of, of, of platform one. You see the sun rising directly over well, the students down there. And then we have sunset, the reverse, looking in the opposite direction, looking towards the west. 
And um, here are some of the alignments from stela I to stela E, from the group of G alters to a stela B, and this other one, which uh, I am particularly impressed with the alignments that have to do with entire architecture. Because putting up individual monuments like these to the E, stela I is, you can do fairly quickly. But building an entire structure to align itself with solar observations is, of course, much more time consuming. It's a bigger effort in terms of time and money. So um, here again, we are seeing the combinations. This is uh, Steel I from Steel E on uh, the sunset of that day. And then this is from the G altars looking towards Steel B. I mean, they're, they're pointing at it and just directly right there. And again, the one that uses the architecture and the staircases in particular, structure 223, looking towards the sunset on the day of Zenith Passage. So there are many, many markers uh, that point to the Zenith Passage and its importance at Kofan. There are, of course, other alignments. This is another one that uh, we worked on and, and on the Sun Court, which is the north end of the Great Plaza. And it shows the equinox and the lineup of the other staircase. Uh, so remember, we saw this one on the sunrises, and of course, here's the sunset on the day of equinox, and you can see in the picture of the alignment of the sun uh, with the staircase on that side. So it's, it's very practical, very simple ways of observing the movements of the sun and being able to divide the solar calendar up into these periods that are so significant and, and, and useful for uh, all of the economic processes involving agricultural production. Of course, as Linda and other scholars have pointed out, highlighting the fact that these were sun lords. These were the sun lords of Kofan. And I particularly liked Stila A because he literally holds the sun in his hands. He has a ceremonial bar. And then on both ends of the bar, we have the face of the sun god, of Kini Jahao, as a, a day and night sun. So literally, the power of these guys rested in their knowledge of the sun. And in fact, I, to me, this says that they controlled it. They were the masters the lords of the sun. This is also something that's repeated on monuments that you see here at the exhibit uh, on Rosa Lila. You get this gigantic uh, sun uh, god mask uh, with uh, a Kukmo on top of it, spelling out the name of the founder, the Ijaz Kukmo, something that is repeated, uh, actually said at an earlier time, even better, by the Margarita panel, where you get face of the Sun Lord coming out of the mouth of the Mokaw and out of the mouth of the Quetzal. So the association of the Sun with the, uh, with the Lords, with the Kings, with the Ahaos, uh, this great Maya city are also very evident and very transparent. And uh, their impact on the whole production of the agricultural site, uh, uh, cycle, of course, is something that from the, the days of Morley has been identified of course, part of the great power of these rules was precisely the, the control of the means of, of production. Now, in summary, <laughs> what I'd like to say is that based on all this archaeoastronomical research at Kofan, we're now predicting that the end of the world will occur on the next solar zenith passage, which is on August 12, 2012. So um, I recommend that you start buying insurance. <laughs> And uh, I couldn't just let the revolutions be, so I thought I should tell you the, the end of the story. Again, it's from uh, Gus Strong's notes where he says, words came in that the government force from Santa Rosa had given battle to the rebels and won a decisive victory. The furious engagement that lasted most of the forenoon came to an end when the rebel general lost his revolver. <laughs> Rebel force is only firearm. <laughs> there were no casualties on either side, but according to reports, it was a most glorious battle. <laughs> anyway, uh, my hat is off uh, to the real stars of uh, studies uh, at Copan, and it is these early scholars to whom we owe so much. Thank you very much.